This video is brought to you by pinesandmaples.ca, where you can find great Canadian products made by Canadian creators. Enjoy! I'm going to tell you a story about a little adventure I had in the summer of 2014, which led to my accidental discovery of a ghost town in the wilderness of southern British Columbia. That summer, I took a week-long solo road trip through the Canadian Rockies, in part for the purpose of acquiring photos for my own website. About halfway through my trip, I decided to pay a visit to Fort Steele, a living history museum just up the BC Highway 95 from the city of Cranbrook. Fort Steele was once a town called Galbraith's Ferry, established in 1864 by a ferry operator named John Galbraith, who made his living transporting prospectors across the Kootenay River. The settlement acquired its new name in 1888, when the famous Mountie Sam Steele came to town to settle a contentious dispute between a local prospector and a Kootenai Indian whom he accused of murder. Fort Steele was never a fort, in the truest sense of the term, although it did house a NWMP outpost. Although the original settlement dwindled into a ghost town in the early 1900s, a true-to-life replica of the frontier community was built in the late 1960s and opened to the public as the Fort Steele Heritage Town a living museum designed to imitate Fort Steele as it appeared in the 19th century. Today, visitors to Fort Steele can walk down the raised wooden sidewalks past horse-drawn carriages, a steam engine locomotive, and actors dressed in period costume who appear baffled by the size of your tiny camera. After enjoying the sights and sounds of Fort Steele, I set out to get a photo of the confluence of the Kootenay and Wild Horse Rivers, where an old CPR railway station once stood. Near a gas station graced by one of those goofy cutout board inviting passersby to transplant their faces onto the vacant countenance of a faceless prospector, I ended up taking a wrong turn and heading up a narrow and somewhat precarious logging road which runs along a cliff overhanging the Wild Horse River. This dirt road, which in retrospect must have been the Fort Steele Wild Horse Road, was a bit of a one-way trail and I had little choice but to follow it until it widened sufficiently to allow me to turn my car around. I drove on and on into the mountains, praying that I wouldn't run into another vehicle bound for Fort Steele. After driving for what seemed like an eternity, I came to a turnoff, which was really nothing more than an eroded bank leading down to the Wild Horse River. As I drove onto the rocky beach and prepared to turn around, I spied to my astonishment a man standing knee deep in the Wild Horse River leaning forward with a pan in his hand. The man waved to me, and I got out of my vehicle and walked over to say hello. The guy, who was dressed in knee-high rubber boots and waterproof coveralls, must have been a few years older than I was. He told me that he was panning for gold, and that he'd already had some luck that morning. Here, I'll show you, he said, producing a quantity of sand from a container. See that? He pointed to a cluster of tiny glittering gold nuggets that stood out from the surrounding sediment. That's 50, 60 bucks, right there. For an instant, a primal flicker of jealously rippled through me, a startling and unexpected sensation, which whispered of the power of the yellow metal that had driven conquistadors through the jungle and stampeders to the Arctic in centuries past. Very cool, I said, suppressing a shudder at my involuntary reaction. Oh yeah, the creek is full of it. Best place to pan in BC, hands down. Really? Yep. The prospector looked up at me in surprise. Don't you know what this place is? This place used to be a boom town, right here where we're standing. You can still see some of the old graves. Just head back along the road you just came up and look for the sign on your left. I did as the prospector suggested and headed back down the one-way trail barely managing to get my vehicle back up the steep embankment. Sure enough, about 20 seconds down the road, I saw a stock paper sign nailed to a tree on the left-hand side of the road. The sign read, Fisherville Historic Trail, and included a picture of a finger pointing down a narrow trail leading into the woods. I guided my car down the steep trail, parked in a small clearing, and got out to do some snooping. As it turned out, I had stumbled upon Fisherville, the epicenter of the youngest offshoot of the Fraser River Gold Rush. Back in 1857, when British Columbia was a cluster of fur trading districts and British colonies, 
Gold was discovered near the confluence of the Fraser and Thompson Rivers, not far from present-day Lytton, BC. In no time, prospectors of American, British, and Chinese extraction flocked to Victoria, took steamers across the Strait of Georgia to New Westminster, present-day Vancouver, and headed up an old Hudson's Bay Company trail called the Douglas Road in what is known today as the Fraser River Gold Rush. In the 1860s, some of the Fraser River prospectors who ventured off the beaten path in search of gold made strikes in the Caribou Plateau of South Central British Columbia. In no time, prospectors from the Fraser Canyon were streaming into the interior of British Columbia in what is known as the Caribou Gold Rush. In 1864, a handful of caribou prospectors who had wandered east of the diggings around Barkerville and Williams Lake, the heart of caribou country, discovered gold on Stud Horse Creek, a tributary of the Kootenay River. By the end of summer, nearly a thousand prospectors were panning for gold on this waterway, which would soon be renamed Wild Horse Creek and Wild Horse River many years later. According to one of the handful of CIBC-sponsored didactic posters erected throughout the ruins of Fisherville, there is an old Kootenai Indian legend purporting to explain the origin of the gold which lies scattered across the bed of Wild Horse Creek. Said to have been passed on by field supervisor Bob Jeffrey of Cranbrook, BC in 1965, the story goes, Once upon a time, the spirit of the red man battled with the spirit of the mountains, and in that battle was sorely wounded. As he lay stricken, the spirit of the mountain sowed the floor of what is now the valley of Wild Horse Creek and all the creeks nearby with a yellow gleaming metal. Mark you, said the spirit of the mountain to his foe as he cast in the last handful. This will call thither men who will possess your land and enjoy your hunting grounds. And these men will be your masters. Truly, the prophecy came to pass. Over 100 years ago came the Argonauts, who found the gold on the Wild Horse Creek and discovered that this is a fair and delectable land. No one truly knows who first discovered gold on Wild Horse Creek, although there are a number of different stories which purport to be the true account. One of these stories was recounted by a miner named Dan Drumheller, who had participated in the rush of 1864. Drumheller's story appeared in the February 22, 1932 issue of the Lethbridge Herald. The Wild Horse Creek discovery was made by a bunch of prospectors, numbering about 60 men during March 1864. Many of these prospectors had been ordered to leave Montana by the Vigilance Committee. They headed for the Walla Walla country late in the fall of 1863. When they reached Frenchtown, a Canadian French settlement near where the city of Missoula now stands, they decided they were out of reach of the vigilantes and continued to spend the winter in the French settlement and hit the trail early the next spring for Walla Walla. I do not pretend to say all these men were bad, but many of them were hard cases. During the winter, there came a mixed breed Indian of the Finley tribe, formed the upper Kootenays of British Columbia to visit the French settlement. This breed had some small nuggets with him, which he exhibited to this bunch of prospectors. And of course they were interested. He told the prospectors he picked the nuggets out of seams on the bedrock, at the bottom of a small clear stream of water, flowing into the Kootenay River, 40 miles above where Fort Steele now stands. The prospectors employed the half-breed to pilot them to his find. They left Frenchtown the 1st of March for the upper Kootenays. When they reached what is now Wild Horse Creek, many of their horses were fagged out. Here they left their worn horses and the greater portion of their supplies and three men, Pat Moran, Mike Brennan, and Jim Reynolds to take care of their stock and supplies. The balance of the party went on up the Kootenay River to Finley Creek. They did not find sufficient gold at Finley Creek to satisfy them. While the main body of men were at Finley Creek, the three men left with the supplies had begun prospecting on the Wild Horse Creek at the mouth. They found a little gold there. They then prospected up the creek some four miles to a box canyon and a perpendicular fall in the creek, but still without success. Then Pat Moran worked his way around above the falls and struck rich pay dirt. When the party returned from Finley Creek, the discovery had been made. Then these men called a miners' meeting and made their own mining laws according to the American custom, notwithstanding that they were in British Columbia, Canada. They made their claims large enough so the 60 prospectors could cover all of the rich ground on the creek. No sooner had gold been discovered on Wild Horse Creek 
Then a boomtown called Fisherville sprouted up in the vicinity of the new diggings. Sir Arthur N. Birch, the colonial secretary of the newly established colony of British Columbia, traveled to Fisherville that summer and reported that the town boasted 700 residents, three restaurants, several saloons, and a large brewery. According to another of the CIBC posters at the Fisherville ruins, named after Jack Fisher, one of the first men to come to Wild Horse Creek, Fisherville was home to the 5,000 miners who would eventually try their luck here. From the beginning, the men who flocked to the Wild Horse Rush were much the same as those who frequented other gold rush towns. These were often desperate men, with little money to show for their work, some one step ahead of the American or British authorities. In the first days of the camp, decisions and legal matters were often decided by elected committees. This followed miners' traditions formed as far back as the California rush of the 1840s. Elected judges and sheriffs would often use force of numbers and arms to mete out laws created as circumstances arose. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please check out our website, pinesinmaples.ca, where you can find all sorts of great Canadian products.